Okay, hi everyone and welcome to the Flare of Biomaterials. Today we're going to be talking about surfaces, which is an extremely important topic in biomaterials research because you can spend all this time designing materials that have the perfect mechanical properties and the perfect thermal, degradative properties, whatever, but really it's only the surface that's interacting with the body and with cells and proteins of the body. So it's really important to understand how those interactions occur and, if you can, and how you can control them. So there's three main topics that we're going to discuss today. The first is protein surface interactions and a couple small ways of um, modulating that. Um, a lot on surface modification and ways that you can actually chemically modify a surface so, so that you can you know, um, proactively control interactions between the surface and the body. Um, and then we're going to talk briefly about biofilm and um, when you have a bacterial infection, which is also on the surface of a material, and how you might be able to combat that. So adsorption of proteins. This is important to understand because it's actually not the material surface that cells interact with. It's actually a layer of adsorbed proteins. And this is something that I think is a little underappreciated in the field. So as soon as you implant a biomaterial into the body, it is immediately coated with proteins from the surrounding area. Um, and especially adhesion proteins, generally, because they're the most abundant in, in blood plasma and blood serum, and also just in tissues. So the material is instantly coated in proteins. And because cells have specific receptors for proteins, that's how they bind. So the proteins permanently stick to the surface, and then the cells can attach to the proteins. So the cells don't actually interact with the surface at all. Okay? unless you add something that they can attach to that they have a receptor for. And we're going to talk about that later in this lecture. So that means that control over protein adsorption gives you control over cell adhesion. And then if you add some more specific things, you can control even more specific um, cell behaviors. Um, but cell adhesion alone is important for a variety of processes, including clot formation, um, the foreign body response. We talked about osteoinductivity before and whether or not bone cells can grow in vascularization, whether or not blood vessels can grow into a material. Um, tissue growth, bacterial colonization, all of this is of a function of protein adsorption to a biomaterial. Um, I guess I'd like to take this moment to talk about the difference between adsorb and absorb, with absorb having a B in it. And this is important because a lot of people have just never heard of adsorption. And that is, the difference is that in adsorption, proteins are actually sticking to the surface of something. And in absorption, like a sponge, you're absorbing the protein. So you can, so a sponge or something that a protein could go inside or a hydrogel, they would absorb proteins. But a surface that can't receive the influx of the proteins that would be adsorbed when they're just sticking. Okay, so it's a pretty big difference. Okay, so why do proteins adsorb? It's actually entirely based on thermodynamics, um, like everything, I guess. But basically, the free energy is minimized when the proteins do stick, stick to the surfaces compared to when they're surrounded by water molecules. Um, and also, they're, well, I guess I'll get into it with the equations, but in general, hydrophilic surfaces have low protein adsorption and hydrophobic surfaces have high protein adsorption. And why is that? It's based on based some simple equations in protein in thermodynamics. Basically, if Gibbs free, ener if Gibbs free energy change is minimized, um, which is governed by that equation, enthalpy minus temperature times the change in entropy, if that is less than zero, then you will have protein adsorption. So van der Waals interactions are just you know, general interactions between um, proteins and the surface. Electrostatic interactions is kind of obvious why that would favor um, protein adsorption. If you have like a negatively charged surface and a positively charged protein, of course, they're going to stick preferentially. The release of water molecules is um, a little less obvious. That's the idea that if you have water molecules on the surface of a biomaterial, as soon as you implant it, you know, there's water molecules there because it's a moist environment in the body. Um, and those water molecules are highly ordered in, like, in kind of a hydrophobic way since the material is a solid and not a liquid. And that is a very, that's very unfavorable in terms of entropy. So if the proteins absorb and the hydrophobic areas of the protein are the ones that are on the surface, that would be an increase in entropy, which would be favorable for um, the Gibbs free energy. And finally, because the protein has their hydro hydrophobic regions are the ones that are actually sticking to the surface, 
Um, that is an unfolding of the protein. It actually could even denature the protein, and that is also favorable for entropy. So for all these reasons, you would have um, you would have protein absorption of a material. And also, that's why you have increased absorption for a hydrophobic material compared to a hydrophilic material. OK, so in general, those are the, the um, parameters that, that govern protein absorption to a material. But there's a couple other ones. Um, well, we talked about charged surfaces. Of course, you're going to have um, a charged protein is going to very preferentially bind to a charged surface, unless it's a repulsive one. Um, ambient conditions, like pH, ionic strength um, in the surrounding area, of course, that's obviously going to affect things because that affects um, solubility and that affects um, you know, what, how the proteins are going to behave. Um, protein characteristics are super important, whether or not they're charged, if they have a large hydrophobic region. Um, stability is something that we'll talk about in the next slide, so I'm going to get into that. Um, concentration. Um, is really important because you could have competition between different proteins, and we're talking about that in a little bit too. Um, diffusion velocity, small molecules diffuse faster than large molecules. So, um, and also small molecules are probably going to fit into smaller spots. Well, they're definitely going to fit into smaller spots on a surface. So if you have, so if a surface is, is immediately covered in protein and you have large ones, other large ones cannot fit, but a small one might be able to. So that, of course, is going to affect it, the size. And surface characteristics, of course, like how hydrophobic or how hydrophilic it is. Um, <clears throat> so this is a table that describes, that summarizes a little bit some predictions you can make about protein absorption to a, to a surface. Um, I think that what the structural stability of the protein is a little bit um, less obvious to think about in this. Um, if a protein is more stable, it's less likely to change its conformation. So maybe it has like a lot of disulfide, so disulfide bonds, which makes it very stable. And then it's less likely to change its conformation in order to stick to a surface. So if it, is, if it only has its hydrophilic um, regions facing outwards, then it's not going to stick to the surface, which is hydrophobic. So um, on the other hand, if it's a pretty unstable protein in solution, if it easily unfolds, and that's governed by all the bonds within the protein itself and their um, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure, um, then that's going to be unstable. If it's pretty easy for it to unfold, then it's going to absorb better. So these are different factors that, um, that govern whether or not a protein absorbs. Um, it's just, so whether or not it's charged, we talked about that. That's pretty obvious. Um, OK, so moving on. OK, so the kinetics of protein absorption is basically that it's really fast immediately. And it's actually, I guess you can, you can barely appreciate it on these graphs that, um, well, actually you can on the concentration versus time graph, that it's a really fast initial absorption that's practically linear. And then it plateaus off into a steady state. Um, and so that means that it's diffusion controlled. It really is just the diffusion of proteins absorbing, going to the surface, and then sticking to them because of the thermodynamics that we just went over. So it's really fast. Um, Apologize for this um, slightly blurry figure. Um, I meant to fix that. But uh, so effects on cell bimaterial interactions. Um, adhesion proteins are some of the most abundant proteins in body fluid and plasma and serum. Um, and that's actually what mediates cell attachment to the biomaterial, and that's why it's called an adhesion protein. So examples of adhesion proteins are like fibronectin, labin laminin, vitronectin. Um, and in this graph, it's actually fibronectin that we're looking at. And um, this is 3T3 cells, which are the fibroblast cell lines. So fibroblast adhesion to hemopolymer glass substrates um, or glass substrates. And what they found is that if you add fibronectin, the cells can attach. And if there's no fibronectin, they can't attach. Um, so that is true for actually a lot of cell types with fibronectin. Um, this is a similar study. Um, I'm not sure, I don't remember the type of cell this was, but this was just saying you could either coat a glass slide with polylysine, which is a charged protein polymer, um, and you have very low cell attachment. The cell is rounded up and not 
really attached. It looks like a water droplet that's not spread on the surface. Um, but if you add fibronectin, if you first coat the uh, surface with fibronectin, the cell can attach and spread out a little bit. So the spreading is a really good indication of whether or not the cell is attached. Just because it's sitting there doesn't mean that it's attached. Um, so these studies that I just discussed are um, they're called pre-adsorption studies. So you can get a lot of information about how or about whether or not cells can attach to different proteins based on this. Um, and it was these that also allowed um, researchers to discover the role of integrins, which are just the actual receptors that the cells use to attach to cell adhesion proteins on a surface. Um, and so you can see in a wild type animal that it's totally healthy and has all its integrins, they can attach really well to different surfaces. Um, but if they're, if they're a knockout, a genetic knockout for the beta-1 integrin, they can't attach to the surface. And so they're all rounded up. So you have to see how they're either spread out or rounded up based on cell attachment. So that's what, so pre-adsorption studies are really useful for extremely basic studies of cell attachment. However, they're not really physiologically relevant because in the body you have a whole diverse mixture of tons of proteins. You don't just have one protein. So it's actually more physiologically relevant to deplete a solution of a given protein and then see how that affects cell behavior. So um, you would turn, you would take you know, like blood plasma, like whole blood plasma, and then um, and then deactivate a protein or not. Um, and this is also more physically, re physiologically relevant because different proteins have different affinities for different surfaces, and that's governed by all of the thermodynamics that we just went over. Um, so a protein in a mixture might actually not really absorb at all, whereas if you just made a solution of that single protein and put that on a glass slide, that would absorb. So you have to make sure that you are, are doing things in a phys physiologically relevant way. So how can you deplete a protein from a mixture? Um, you could do immunoadsorption chromatography, so you run the, the liquid through a column that extracts a certain protein, and then you take a liquid out and then you can study the liquid that way. You can do selective enzymatic degradation, like if you're trying to remove collagen from a solution, you can add collagenase, and that would, that would degrade all the collagen, and you're left with whole serum but no collagen. Um, we just talked about how you can use mutant animals that are, knocking, that are knockouts for a particular protein of interest, um, or you can inhibit the receptor for that protein using blocking antibodies. So these are all different ways that you could do a depletion study to see what is the effect of that particular protein. Um, and so depletion studies were what um, is the way that researchers discovered the importance of fibrinogen for platelet adhesion, which is really important in blood clotting which is a huge area of research is try to, how do you inhibit blood clots on an implant, especially in something that's going in a blood vessel like a stent. If you have blood clotting, that would immediately cause an aneurysm or a heart attack. Um, so the other thing that's interesting about um, fibrinogen that you can see from this graph is that it, um, it's not exactly dose dependent. It increases for a given concentration and then it starts to decrease again. And that's because you have competitive binding and a competitive absorption from other proteins that are in the plasma. <clears throat> so what is competitive absorption? It's based on the idea that different proteins will bind preferentially to different surfaces depending on their properties. Um, for example, heparin is a known inhibitor of the absorption of fibronectin because it's just, um, it's, it makes the, the surface unfavorable for fibrinogen to come in just based on how they are. Um, how they're structured. Um, and so what it results in is selective adsorption from mixtures of proteins. And so, and you can imagine it's very easy to, to um, conceptualize if you have one charged protein in a whole mixture of neutral proteins and your surface is, is charged in the opposite charge, of course that one is going to preferentially bind. Um, so you have enrichment of the surface phase. So whatever binds to the surface is not necessarily indicative of what the concentration was in the solution. So that means you can't just say like, oh, 10% of my solution was fibronectin, so that means 10% of the surface phase is fibronectin. It doesn't work like that because of competitive absorption. Okay, um, the Raman effect, which we sort of talked about earlier, is that small and abundant proteins like fibrinogen will be the first ones to absorb, but then later, a little bit later in time, um, proteins that are larger but have higher affinity for the surface will replace them. Um, 
So that change over, um, so that decrease over time, and also the in the uh, you know the parabolic curve that you have there. That's called the Vroman effect. Okay, so that's really great that you can um, add proteins to surfaces in order to control cell adhesion. Um, but you, it's actually not even that easy because the, the actual process of the protein binding to the surface changes the actual protein itself. Um, so the protein activity, in other words, varies in the solvated and absorbed states. Um, so one reason is that you have a higher local concentration or lower. We just said that it could be higher or lower depending on um, you know, its affinity. So the, the actual concentration changes. Um, you might also have steric hindrance or um, you might block access to the active site of the protein when it, um, when it, binds, when it absorbs to a surface. And so you can study that using antibody binding, but you can see how that would change its bioactivity. Um, Similarly, changes in protein conformation would, um, so if the, if the protein unfolds, which we know it does upon sticking, how much of its activity is, remain is maintained or, or does it maintain its activity at all? Um, so you can study that using differential scanning calorimetry because when proteins unfold, they release heat. So, um, so that's a good thing to study there. And of course, all of this depends on the surface, and binding depends on the surface. So um, it's really important to understand how proteins absorb and what governs their absorption so that you can, um, you can predict that behavior and hopefully control it. Um, so this is an example of how proteins affect the surface that they bind to. So it's not just cell interactions, it also can control their um, physical properties. So if you take a droplet of water and you put it on um, polyethylene or a hydrophobic or a hydrophobic polymer, um, it would beat up and not interact with the surface. It's, it's less wettable. What they're showing here is contact angle. So you can actually measure the angle that is formed with those with the red lines in the image. Um, if that angle is greater than 90 degrees, it's considered like a non-wettable, so the angle that way, if it's obtuse, then it's considered a non-wettable surface. Um, but if, this, if the water droplet spreads out because now it's hydrophilic, then the angle is less than 90 degrees and it means it's wettable. Um, so if you, if you first absorb a protein onto a, hydrophilic, a hydrophobic surface, you can see from this study that it makes it hydrophilic. The water can now spread out on it. So contact angle, excuse me, is a direct measure of um, hydrophilicity or hydro and, hydropho and surface wettability. Okay, we're still doing principles of protein absorption. <laughs> um, okay, so we kind of went over this. Oh, that's why I'm doing this, because it's a summary. <laughs> okay, so the principles that you need to take away from this are that monolayer mono absorption and the consequent competition between proteins in the bulk and then absorb means that not all proteins in the plasma or the serum phase can be equally represented on the surface. So that's something that's definitely important to keep in mind. Driving forces are the are intrinsic properties of the surface and also of the, um, of the proteins. Surfaces vary in their selectivity of absorption and so do proteins. Um, the biological activity of the absorbed protein will change depending on what it absorbs to and how much it changes its protein, or how much it changes its conformation. Um, and the absorbed protein will change the surface properties of the material. So this is a summary of what you need to know about protein absorption, so you can't make assumptions that, um, that are not true. Okay. So, given that the absorption of proteins is so important for all the cellular interactions that, we talk, that, that occur in the body, what are some ways that we can modify the surfaces so that you can actually control in a proactive, rational way the interaction between cells and the biomaterial? And a bonus of this is that modifying the surface doesn't change the bulk, the bulk properties of the material so that you can, you can design this awesome material that has the perfect mechanical response to the loads it's going to receive, and then you modify the surface to have more favorable interactions with the cells or with blood or whatever. Okay, so there's different ways that you can do it. Um, mechanical, we talked about that a little bit in the first lecture about um, metals, and so there's roughening and etching, and that's 
an active area of research to see how that affects cell adhesion and, and integration. Um, there's physical, physical chemical, which we'll go into a little bit, um, and then chemical and biological modification, we'll talk about a little bit more, um, because that's, I think, a really interesting area of research that's happening. Okay, so um, surface topography, this is, these are some pictures of cells attached to a titanium surface that has micro pits that are on the micro scale, like 100 microns or something. And then in each successive picture, they added nano nodules that have different heights. So the first one is they're 100 nanometers high, the second one 300, and the last one 500. And depending on that, the cells were actually able to spread more, which means it was more cell adhesion. And this is one of a large number of, of studies that have just in the last couple of years shown that nanotopography is really important for cell attachment, which we didn't know before because we never had the technologies that available to make nanostructures and to visualize them. So this is really cool. Um, and then, okay, so this was osteoblasts, and this study went on to show that that nanotopography also affected their osteogenic differentiation. So if they were, so these were MSCs differentiating into bone cells, um, and it looks like the 300 nanometer nodules had the greatest osteogenic capacity compared to the other ones. So the topography of the surface can actually affect the the potential for differentiation of stem cells. Um, and you also see that there's a difference between untreated and UV treated. So UV light is another way that you can modify um, the surface of a material. Um, I'm not actually sure if there's a general statement you can make about how UV treatment affects the material. Um, it, I think it affects some, some materials differently. Like for polymers, it might cause some local degradation on the surface, for example. Okay, so ion beam implantation is when you can take, you take a high energy ion beam and you actually inject it at a surface and all the, en the ions enter the surface zone of the material. And depending on the parameters, that depends how far into the material um, the, the zone of these ions go. Sometimes this is called electropolishing because it's really useful in metals research to um, prevent crack propagation, which reduces wear because the ions get in the way of cracks that are propagating, so it stops it right there. Um, and also, this is effectively alloying, which increases resistance to corrosion. Um, so that's a really, so ion beam implantation is really useful for metal modification. Similarly, ion beam assisted deposition is when you shoot those ions at a specific, um, like some other molecules, but in this case it's hydroxyapatite, which generates secondary ions because of the energy you impart there. And then those ions, you can direct them towards your material and it actually coats that surface. So that's how you could use a more, um, you can use pretty much whatever molecule you want to, um, to coat a surface. A somewhat similar method is plasma treatment. So plasma is the fourth state of matter. We have a huge plasma institute here at Drexel. Um, and basically you can use plasma treatment of the surface to in introduce reactive groups. It just generates these reactive groups on the surface um, and then you can throw in some other chemicals and they, um, they can attach if, it, if, they're all, if the uh, reactivity is favorable. Um, so that's one way that you could you could have some chemical modification, um, but you can also have plasma that's made of a specific ion, like oxygen ions, and then you could use that to increase the hydrophilicity of a surface, which is really useful if you're trying to, say, reduce protein absorption, since we saw earlier that hydrophilic surfaces have less protein absorption. Um, and you can also use plasma spray deposition in a similar way to the ion beam deposition to um, heat up some molecules and then deposit them on the surface. So that can be a really useful way to control the surface. Um, radiation grafting is, I guess, really similar to these other methods where you're now using um, electron beams or x-rays to generate reactive species in the surface of the molecule. And then now it's active and you can add in a monomer and they react according to free radical polymerization. And they can either have a chain if you propagate the chain or you can just have a, um, you know, you can have it stoichiometrically controlled so it's just a thin layer of the, of the monomers. Um, 
And this is an example of how they used that to then add a different functional group onto that. So they had like a polymer chain spacer, then they put a functional group on top of those polymer chains, and the functional groups in this example were meant to pull metal out of, um, out of water. This was actually a water treatment example they were doing. Um, but you can see how that is um, really useful. Um, okay, so then when you have gr certain groups on a surface of a material that are already somewhat reactive, like hydroxyl groups, um, you can add certain chemicals, which we're going to go into a lot more detail if you're curious now. <laughs> um, you can add certain chemicals to com chemically modify those groups. So silanization, uh, which is talked about in the book, is when you use these um, like polydimethylsiloxane um, you add that on and the, the group actually binds to the hydroxyl groups and then that converts them all to a hydrophobic moiety. So if it was hydrophilic, now it's become hydrophobic. So depending on how much you add, um, you can control the relative hydrophilicity or hydrophobicity of a material. So that's nice. Um, this is an example of how silanization was used to attach the RGD peptide. Um, which is like arginine, glycine, some other amino acid that the symbol is D. Um, but RGD peptide is one of the most famous peptides that's studied for cell adhesion. It's isolated from fibronectin, so that's like why fibronectin is adhesive because of the RGD sequence. It's only three amino acids. Um, but you can see, so this is titanium, not a lot of cell attachment. This is osteoblast. When you silanize it, now it's become really hydrophobic, so there's even less cell attachment because it's too hydrophobic. Um, and then if you silanize it but then add the RGD peptide using the technique that I just showed before, um, now you've got a lot of cell attachment. And then the second, the other figure was just using a different um, sim peptide similar to RGD. So this brings me into how useful it can be to add bioactive moieties. So we talked about the ways that you can modify a surface in terms of its actual structures so of surface topography, um, also its, chem its physical modification um, by changing its, um, by adding ions, you can change its chemical structure using, um, by salinization and some other things that we're going to go into now. Um, but I think the, the coolest application of surface modification is adding bioactive moieties. So surface immobilized biomolecules. <coughs> Basically, any time you add, you immobilize something on a surface that has some bioactivity, um, that's what we're talking about here. So you can have proteins or peptides, including enzymes, antibodies, cell adhesion molecules. Um, we were just talking about RGD, which is a cell adhesion molecule. Um, you can have a ligand if you are trying to get a specific cell type to bind to, to it, or if you're trying to induce a specific behavior from a certain cell type. You can have drugs like um, antimicrobial agents or anti-cancer agents, um, and then other things like nucleic acids, including siRNA, which is useful for um, you know downregulating a certain gene. So there's some different methods of mobilization that we can use. Of course, you can use physical absorption, which the first half of this lecture was going into. How can you control the surface of a material so that you can get the, you can get protein absorption? Um, but if you want to be a little bit more specific about it, you can use physical entrapment. So that's like hydrogels. You can load them in a hydrogel, encapsulate them in a degradable microparticle, um, disperse them in a matrix. We're going to talk about that a whole lot more in biomaterials, too, when we talk a lot more about drug delivery. So I'm not going to talk about that today. What I am going to talk about is um, covalent attachment. So probably the most common ways are through NHS chemistry. Um, this, sulfide bulk chemistry, um, shift based reactions, which is not on that list, um, and the biotin avidin system. So we're going to go through each of these because I think they're really useful. Okay, so if you're going to covalently immobilize a biomolecule, this is often called bioconjugation, and it's a whole field in itself. So um, there's a lot of textbooks just on bioconjugation that you can look into if you think this would be useful for you. Um, so first of all, you need reactive groups on the surface of the material, but you could always add that in by having some plasma treatment or other high energy treatment. 
Um, but then that, that of course makes them. So this is a, what you need is the reactive groups, root groups for the requirement. Um, and then you can use all those methods. Okay. Um, okay, so hydroxyl groups are on a lot of things. Um, NH2 is on the N terminus of every polypeptide chain, so that's a really useful target if you're trying to, if you're trying to attach a protein. Carboxylic acids, similarly on the C terminus, terminus of every polypeptide chain. Um, sulfhydryl groups are found on the side chain of cysteines, so that's also a really good target, um, especially if like your active site is near an NH2 that or a primary NH2 that you don't want to you don't want to mess up the the active site, so you don't want to go near it at all. So maybe you target the sulfhydryl group, um, and then you can use a. Uh, a CH2 double bond, which you can create by oxidizing carbohydrate groups. Um, yeah, so that's what you could use. Okay, so the first common method that I want to talk about for targeting an, an amine group, well, this is basically when you convert a carboxylic acid group into an amine group. Um, and so, or for, it's not converting, it's attaching with, it, with an amine group. So if you had a protein that has an amine group, because all proteins do, especially on the end terminus, but generally it has to be a primary amine, so, so you know, on the end of a, of a polypeptide chain, it can't, be just, it can't be just an NH coming off of the, off of the protein. Um, so if you have a primary amine, this is a really easy way to attach it to um, something with a carboxylic acid group that's available. So EDC, I don't have what it stands for here because it's really long. It's basically a type of carbodiamide, and so is DCC. You can kind of think of them as they definitely have the same chemistry if um, they're not the same molecule. Um, and so if you have a carboxylic acid on your surface that you're trying to modify, if you have free carboxylic acids there and you add EDC, that turns them into an active ester, and then when you add the primary amine, it causes a covalent bond and it releases a urea byproduct. So if you look at one attached to two there, now you have your amine, your primary, your protein two, chemically covalently t attached to your surface, which had free carboxylic acids in the past. So that's a really easy way to do it. Um, NHS is often combined with EDC reactions to increase the efficiency of the EDC reaction uh, because it stabilizes an intermediate conjugate. So this is just a different chemistry also for primary amines um, where the, you have like an NHS ester and you add it to, if you, if, you have, if you can add that to your surface, then you add a protein that'll um, cause a covalent link there. Um, methyl met or methacrylate N groups are photoreactive and this is probably the most common method of attachment that I've seen, if not, NHS is probably the most common, and then methacrylation is another one. So it's pretty easy to methacrylate proteins and any surface that has a free amine by just adding maleic anhydride, or methacrylate anhydride, which is shown there. Um, and that just adds these, these um, somewhat unstable methacrylate groups. And then once you have the methacrylate groups, as soon as you add UV light and a photo initiator, that, adds a, that generates a free radical and makes it able to attack um, like a, a, a double bond that's in another, um, another molecule that you're adding. Or if you add a methacrylate group to a protein and a methacrylate group to your surface, then you can use a photo initiator to make them both reactive and they'll attach to each other. So that's how you could get, you could you could really use this to couple anything to your surface. And the cool thing about all of these is that they're completely covalent, so they're not going anywhere. Okay, another, another really common way is using um, amylaamide, which is um, sulfhydryl reactive. So like I said, sulfhydryls are on um, cysteine, the cysteine amino acid. So this example is first using NHS to add this SMCC um, sulfhydryl reactive group to a, well in this example it's an antibody, and then they, once they have that on there, then they can add the sulfhydryl group and they react and that's how you combine things. So there's all these different ways um, to attach different things to your surface. Um, maintenance of bioactivity is a super important issue because any time that you're modifying the structure of the protein by adding an NHS and then linking it to a solid biomaterial, um, 
of course, you have the possibility for um, denaturing the protein because you're going to you're going to interfere with its folding. And actually, it's not just a possibility; it's like a really high likelihood that you're going to interfere with the with the bioactivity. Um, so one way to avoid this is if you can if you know what the active site of a protein is, which which uh, molecular biologists learn by doing X-ray crystallography and, and um, modeling studies. If they can tell you what the active site of the protein is, then you can and you can target a spot far away from it. Then you're pretty safe that you're not going to mess up the uh, activity of the protein. But if you've got an active site and like your primary amine is right next to it, and you try to do any chest chemistry, that's probably going to cause steric hindrance, and your active site won't be useful anymore. So. For easy, for just simple bioconjugation studies where maybe it's not the final thing, maybe you're just trying something out, I like to use biotinylation. Um, biotin is a really small molecule, um, and it's not, it's just a ligand, it's not like a protein, so it's, it's very stable as well. Um, and avidin is a protein, and the avidin biotin complex is the strongest known non covalent interaction, and it's so strong that you can pretty much think of it as covalent. Um, it's not. It's not though. So I mean, it could break apart at some point. Um, but but like I said, for like preliminary studies, you could use this. Like if you're researching something and you want to attach a protein, this is a good method to use. But you would not ever take it through good laboratory practices to manufacture and to taking a product to the market, right? Okay. So the other nice thing about the avid and biotin complex is that it's highly specific. So if you attach, if you, um, okay. Before I get there. Also, avidin can bind for up to four biotin molecules. So you can actually use it as like a sandwich. So if you attach a lot of biotin to your surface and, and a lot of biotin to a, a protein, and then you sandwich avidin in between, it will bind it together. Um, so biotinylation is probably more commonly used as an amplifying tool. Um, so this is an example of just an immunohistochemistry. If you have an antigen that you're trying to detect the presence of, and you take a primary antibody and a secondary antibody that is that binds to that primary. If you add a biotin conjugate to the secondary antibody, then you can amplify that response by adding more avidin and more biotin until you can see it. So you can take you can get really low detection of um, things that are just barely there. Okay, so that's the more common use of biotinylation. It's so common that it has a verb, biotinylate. Um, I prefer to use it as a bioconjugation tool. So like I said, you can take a scaffold or a surface of the biomaterial, add biotin using some of the chemistries that we talked about before, um, and then add avidin, and then take a protein. In this example, it's BM2P2, which might be useful for bone in growth. Um, and you attach biotin to that, and then they'll be attached together. So you can you can study that if you want. Um, okay, so this might sound like it's complicated because how are you going to possibly get all those molecules? But Pierce at, at Thermo Scientific is an excellent resource for the chemistry behind all of this. That's where I got all of the diagrams that I was just showing. Um, if you go to, if you click on protein methods library and then overview of cross-linking and protein modification, the page, the web pages just go on and on, giving you an overview in really easy to understand terms how the chemistry actually works between. If, and they actually, this company sells all of these products, so it'll link directly to the products that you need to buy. So in my own research, I bought biotin conjugated to sulfo NHS. And then I was able to just mix that with the protein and the primary amine on the protein and the sulfo NHS attached to biotin automatically bonded and now I had biotinylated protein. So it's a really easy way to do biochemical conjugation. And they sell all of these cross-linking um, molecules that we mentioned, so you should really check out this website. Um, and I say that it sells lots of idiot proof product, products because there's like no thinking involved. It's like if you have a primary amine, add this and it will add biotin to your protein. So it's really nice. Okay. And I do not work for them. <laughs> so I don't have to. I'm just a really excellent sales, salesperson for them. Okay. So what are some applications of this? Um, you can immobilize adhesive proteins to a biomaterial if you want to direct cell adhesion. Um, if you, if you, controlled really well how you immobilize the proteins, you might be able to direct cell migration in the direction. You know, you only have adhesion where you put the, the protein and then you might be able to direct cell migration if you did like a concentration gradient and you had increasing cell adhesion. Um, you can also prevent adhesion because if you coat it with heparin, we saw earlier that that 
um, competitively, that basically inhibits the binding of fibronectin, which is really important for the binding of a lot of cells. Not all cells, but a lot of cells. Um, so that would be some, so that you might want to prevent adhesion. If you want to specifically trap cells, you could put an antibody that is specific for that cell, and then you could, they would, um, that's sort of, they, you know, they would preferentially attach. Um, and then you might want to direct specific cellular function. So I said, you know, if you add BNP2, maybe that would increase osteo um, conductivity. So there's that. Um, I'm getting a little bit off topic with this slide, but I want to briefly mention micropatterning because it's really cool. Um, basically, uh, you, take, you can micropattern your proteins in a controlled way onto a surface. And then, so these are examples of micropatterning fibronectin onto PDMS, which is so hydrophilic that cells cannot attach because proteins can't absorb. Um, and then you put fibronectin, they only put them in the areas that are red in those ones, and you can see how the cells only attach in those areas. And this is really useful in in vitro studies of cells or in tissue engineering applications. Um, but the, the Christmas wreath on the right is an example of when they used fibronectin to, they, those are endothelial cells, they seeded into a circle, and they were able to, to determine that um, the endothelial cells actually have a chiral nature in that they preferentially go in a certain direction. And no one ever knew that about endothelial cells because um, we didn't have a micro pattern. So that's my lab at Columbia. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So you can control the bioactivity of biomaterials, and that's wonderful. But another really useful way to control the surfaces is to control bacterial adhesion. Um, bacterial infection of biomaterials is a huge problem that is especially um, important in materials that are transcutaneous, like a catheter that is going from outside the body into the body in order to drain um, you know, urine or if you have like a venous catheter. Um, contact lenses, which are in, which are like on the body, are constantly in contact with bacteria, they're, they're extremely susceptible to um, bacterial colonization. Um, but even fully implanted materials can still become contaminated at the time of surgery. Um, so if you have like a joint replacement, that can absolutely become contaminated because you're not in a sterile environment. Everything that you, you try to keep it as sterile as possible, you know, you sterilize all the instruments and it's done under like a, it's usually done in like this hood kind of area and the, the surgeons wear masks, but it's still possible. And that's why the length of surgery is directly proportional to the time of the surgery, like how long it takes, is directly proportional to the risk of infection because you have that happening. Um, and this is really important, and, ba and bacterial con contamination of biomaterials leads to 100,000 deaths per year in the United States, so it's not a small problem. Um, so, bacterial colonization of, um, of a biomaterial. Biofilm is a slimy film containing bacteria that covers the, the biomaterial. It can also contain fungi. But what's really important to know is that biofilm bacteria are extremely different from their free counterparts, which are called planktonic bacteria. So if you, even though that's the bacteria that's forming them. So if some bacteria are like, you know, they're planktonic, they're free floating in the surgery suite, if they drop into the material, or they drop into this open surgery area, they go into the body and they attach to the biomaterial, they start to convert into a different phenotype of cell that generates a biofilm. And they secrete these exopolysaccharides that turn into a slime, and it actually, they actually behave extremely differently from planktonic bacteria. So it actually was kind of recent that they discovered how different they are from their planktonic counterparts, and this has really revolutionized um, the development of antibacterial materials. Um, so for example, they express an entirely different set of genes that's really involved in interactions with other bacteria in the, in the area, and they're more resistant to drugs for a lot of reasons. Um, mostly because there's so many bacteria in such a close space that if they have some plasmid, if they have some gene that makes them more resistant to a drug, it's very easy for them to exchange that with other bacteria in the area. So if you add an antibiotic that kills some bacteria that are less resistant, the ones that are more resistant, just you know, um, by chance, they'll survive and then they'll, they'll uh, mutate the rest of them. So that's how you have, so they're a lot easier to develop um, antibody, antibiotic resistant ones. Um, also, the drug has to diffuse into this biofilm, which is actually like a slimy matrix. So um, that would affect how your how effective your antibiotics are. Um, 
It's also really important to remember that lab strains of bacteria are extremely different from wild bacteria. So controlled testing is actually somewhat difficult. Um, you can't just take E. coli that we grow in like microbiology 101 and put it on the biomaterial as a test of whether or not it's going to have a biofilm formation because they're really different. So when you're doing these studies, you actually have to take bacteria that have been freshly isolated from an infected patient. You can't, and it, they, you can't even expand them that much before they stop behaving how they would in the wild. So in order to have any sort of in vitro testing that is relevant for a clinical application, you have to use it from an infected patient. And then because you have differences from patient to patient, you can see how that would make testing really difficult. So biofilm formation, there's three stages. Um, and so biomaterials that are biofilm resistant ideally would target one or all of these three stages. So the first one, as you might expect, is adhesion of the bacteria to the surface. And then after that, they start secreting these molecules called exopolysaccharides, and they have the three-dimensional biofilm slimy development. And then they, they have detachment of, from the biofilm of single cells, which then can move on down the biomaterial and spread that biofilm. So good biofilms, good biomaterials that are resistant to biofilms would target one of these stages. And this is why it was so, this is why biofilm microbiology was so important that we learned just in the last couple decades because they, because they do behave differently from regular bacteria, if you can target one of these things, you're off to a good start. So the first one might be inhibition of microbial adhesion. Um, so like mammalian cells, bacteria also need proteins to adhere to. So if you limit protein absorption, that can really limit microbial attachment. Um, bacteria can still bind to hydrophilic surfaces, but they definitely will have a harder time. So a lot of times when researchers are trying to develop biomaterials that are anti-biofilm, they just make them hydrophilic. Um, you can coat with heparin, which reduces fibronectin absorption too, but other proteins will still absorb, which the, the bacteria can really, can really do. So hydrogel coatings are really popular. Hydrogel coated catheters are um, very useful in the clinic. Um, so they, they, that would impede all, all uh, protein absorption, which really helps. So there's a whole chapter in your textbook called non-fouling surfaces. This is basically just hydrophilic surfaces. <laughs> so it's the same concepts that we talked about before with um, why hydrophilic surfaces don't have protein absorption. It's just based on thermodynamics. Um, keeping in mind that this also prevents cell interactions with mammalian cells. This is not specific to bacterial cells. So if you have something that you want to interact with, the, the cells of the body, like if you have you know, an implant, a joint implant that needs the bone to grow into, if you cover it with a hydrophilic material, that's not going to happen. Um, but for some things, like for a catheter, that actually is really useful. You, want, you don't want it to integrate with the body because you want to be able to pull it out and you, and you want it to be completely free of bacteria. So um, you may have heard of pegylation, which is so common that it got its own verb as well. Um, so peg is polyethylene glycol. That molecule there is an example of, um, of a long peg with a uh, NHS on the end so that you can attach it to something if you want. So pegylating is when you add a peg molecule to something in order to make it more hydrophilic. Um, and so you can do all sorts of, all sorts of uh, molecular weights of the peg if you want to change that length. Um, people also use this as a um, like a crosslinker if you want if you had like peg dimethacrylate is really common so if you have a peg molecule with, with two functional um, methacrylate groups on each end you could activate those using a photo initiator and UV light and then they could crosslink something but and then you can control the space in between in case steric hindrance is a problem or something so pegylating is really um, really common if if only just to make a hydrophilic surface. Okay, um, <clears throat> antimicrobial coatings are also really popular. Um, so that's basically where you just coat a material with antibiotics or bacteriophages, which I think is really cool. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit on the next slide. Um, but typically you have like a controlled release system from a hydrogel coating or from some other polymer. Um, there's actually not a, nothing that's on the market right now. It has a very good controlled release system for antibiotics. It's all pretty much rapid, um, and you can see why that would not work very well for um, 
for inhibiting biofilm because if any were if any were not killed in the rapid deployment of the antibiotics, then now you don't have any drug anymore, and the bacteria could um, could form the biofilm. Um, and then of course, anytime you have antibiotics, no matter um, no matter what the release profile is, that's highly susceptible to the development of antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is a problem in not just for an individual patient, but it's super important in, for hospitals that have lots of patients. And if they are spreading bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, now you can have really deadly infections that maybe would not have been. Um, so that's a problem. Um, silver is a really useful antimicrobial agent that um, is less susceptible to the development of antibiotic resistance. Um, Basically, silver ions complex with ions that bacteria need more than mammalian ions, but um, the mamma mammalian cells still need those ions, so there is a potential for cytotoxicity. Um, and also, it's still possible that bacteria could become resistant. Um, I think bacteriophages are a really cool way to target and um, to target bacteria, so there are viruses that you may re you may remember learning about a really long time ago, um, but they're basically like an outer shell of protein containing the viral genome, and they attach to a bacteria and they inject their their DNA, incorporates it into the to the bacteria, and then the bacteria they actually hijack the bacteria's protein making machinery to make more to make progeny of the bacteriophage, and so. That's how they keep replicating. So they actually replicate in response to bacteria. So it's like a dose response. The more bacteria you have, the more the bacteriophage will replicate itself. And then they die out in the absence of bacteria. So it's like a self-controlling thing. So if you add a bacteriophage, there's a really cool um, study that I just saw where they they conjugated, using these bioconjugation techniques, of bacteri bacteriophages to the surface of a catheter. And then when there was bacteria, they replicated in response to the bacteria, and then as soon as they killed them all, it died down. So it was like a self-controlling mechanism. So this is sort of a new area of research that was only, it was actually studied a lot in the 30s, but then it was really poorly controlled because there's like thousands of different types of bacteriophages that we didn't really know that much about. So the research was all over the place and it was kind of forgot about for a while. But now we're starting to see um, more research on it, which I think is very exciting. Okay, so that is all how you can actually kill the bacteria before they even start a biofilm. But once they start the biofilm, um, you could also interfere, well, you, you want to kill them in a, in a biofilm, but you could also interfere with the development of the biomaterial at all. Um, so if the bacteria adhere, if you, if you limit the, the biofilm, you're still in good shape. So in, what, one of the biggest differences between bacteria in biofilms and not in biofilms is that the biofilm bacteria have what's called quorum sensing. So they know that other bacteria are in the area and they all start making biofilm together. And they won't express these quorum sensing genes and molecules if they don't sense other bacteria. So if we know what these molecules are, if you can block them then you, and you block quorum sensing, you won't have biofilm formation. So um, there's a couple different agents that are known to do that and they work pretty well. You can also disaggregate the biofilm matrix by just adding a matrix degrading enzyme in there. Um, and then you probably would want to kill the bacteria after that so that they don't just start it over again. Um, and you might also want to try combining antibiotics with some matrix dispersing enzyme and maybe also with bacteriophage and maybe also silver. <laughs> you know, just hit them in many different ways so that they have no way to become resistant to all of them and so that you really get them. Um, and there's also some current research exploring the use of um, more controlled drug delivery than what we currently see, um, like so longer release profiles, um, and also electric current and ultrasound, which seems pretty promising. So those are all ways that you can target um, a microbial infection on the surface of a material. So in conclusion, um, Surfaces are hugely important in biomaterial research because that's how you can actually control interactions with the body, which you all know is what I think is one of the most important aspects of biomaterials research is how it actually interacts with the body. Um, and the nice thing about them is that they're relatively easy to modify so that you can control protein absorption and so that you can specifically direct cell material interactions. Um, and also understanding of, micro, of biofilm microbiology is very important because you can sterilize your material all you want, but if it becomes infected, which it very easily can, then the person would be in grave danger.
Thank you.